Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Kumar, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in Toronto, so to speak, uh, uh, even if it's online. Uh, I was a postdoc at Toronto. That was my first postdoc uh, position after my PhD. This was more than about 20 years ago now. And it's one of the best cities I have lived and worked in. I, I, I showed Kumar as that logged in, say I got myself a fields mug from my previous visit to the Fields Institute and I still, anyway, I've had very good times in Toronto and I wish I was there personally giving this talk. All right. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the arithmetic of Hecker characters and their L functions. This is uh, somewhat of a classical topic, but there is a certain point uh, about the special values of L functions attached to Hecker characters, which has seemingly gone uh, unobserved uh, before. And in some sense, the talk is kind of bringing to light a certain very delicate sign problem, uh, which appears in the special values. But this is, in some sense, I'm, I'm giving you the punchline even before I get there. So I will begin by motivating uh, the objects and what I wish to study. So uh, as a historical motivation, let me uh, talk about uh, Dirichlet characters. <clears throat> so I take an integer n uh, and a Dirichlet character modulo n is a homomorphism from the group of integers relatively prime to n, z mod n z cross to c cross. And given such a chi, Dirichlet considered its L function, Ls chi, uh, which is uh, summing over n chi of n by n to the s, where you define chi of n to be zero if n is not relatively prime to that model as capital N and uh, it's chi of uh, little n itself if n is relatively prime. This notation, so people who work with L functions, you know, uh, if you're in the periphery, uh, this, uh, you know, the L sometimes people think is uh, maybe due to Langlands because L functions are very prominent objects in the Langlands program, but this is actually Dirichlet's notation. And one might only guess that maybe he used L because his first name start, starts with L. Yeah. Anyway, so L is uh, L function, that is just a historical notational accident going back to Dirichlet. And the, the reason Dirichlet was interested in uh, looking at this uh, function is he wanted to prove that there are infinitely many primes in arithmetic progressions. So this is one of the first kind of cornerstone uh, theorems in analytic number theory. And if the, the heart of the matter is if chi is a non-trivial Dirichlet character, then the value of this function at s equals one is not zero. And from this, one can deduce that uh, if I take a arithmetic progression with the common difference being this modulus capital N, uh, and the first term is relatively prime to capital N, then there are infinitely many primes in the arithmetic progression. And furthermore, the density of primes, uh, one has to define what one means by density. This is uh, one over phi of N, where phi is the Euler function. So let me do a kind of very easy example. Let me take N equals four. If I look at the residue classes modulo four, then these are you know, the remainders that you get by dividing by four, which are zero, one, two, or three. And so if I look at those which are relatively prime to four, then uh, mod four, this just boils down to one and three. So this is a group of order two. There's only, there's a unique non-trivial character of this group of order two, which maps one to one necessarily, and three, gets, since it's non-trivial, gets mapped to minus one. So if you run through the recipe of attaching that uh, series here, this, uh, Oh, by the way, can you see my cursor if I move it, move this on the uh, file? If someone can let me know. Do you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Put it in. yeah okay. Very good. Thanks. So, uh, if you take this L series, uh, this Dirichlet series, for this particular function, and I put um, and I, I go through the recipe, I get this function: one minus uh, one by three to the s plus one by five to the s minus one by seven to the s, and so on. In particular, if I plug in S equals one, this is the classical uh, Madhava Leibniz series in often in books and calculus, it's attributed to Leibniz. Uh, turns out that uh, Madhava, uh, for those of you who haven't heard this name, is a person who was at the heart of the Kerala school of mathematics going back to the 14th century. And those people had figured um, these kind of results, uh, except they had uh, couched such insights into Sanskrit verses and which no one uh, understood until much later. 
anyway, so uh, this series is one of the starting points of a certain subject called the special values of L functions. And this identity, one minus one third plus one fifth minus one seventh, et cetera, adding up to pi by four, uh, in particular, that's, this guy is non-zero. So one can deduce by Dirichlet's theorem that there are infinitely many primes of the form 4k plus one or 4k plus three. But in this talk, I'm interested in formulae of this kind. Uh, so this is a special value of NL function. And exactly what kind of results I'm after will become clear as we progress a little further. In general, it's one can't expect to have such a clean and beautiful looking formula for uh, higher L functions. But in any case, the goal is to study the special values of uh, L functions attached to certain kind of characters, which Hecker introduced, which we'll just call Hecker characters. And these are generalizations of Dirichlet characters. Okay, so let me uh, slightly jazz up the situation and let me consider Dirichlet characters of a number field. But before I get to a number field, let me uh, do a little exercise. All right, let me just you know, mention something which is well known. I take an integer n, let me write down the prime factorization like this uh, as the product of p and s, s being the support, if you will, of capital N and p to the sum exponent, which is mp. Then if I look at iq, this is the group of ideals of q, and I go modulo principal ideals, this is q cross. So iq mod q cross is the group of uh, ideal classes for Q. And a further quotient by this subgroup inside the group of ideals. At infinity, I put positive reals for primes in dividing N. I look at this uh, open compact subgroup of the group of units, one plus uh, P to the MP ZP. And for P not dividing S, you take the full units, ZP cross. Then it's a, it's a nice little exercise for if you, for learning algebraic number theory that this is in fact Z mod and Z cross. Now remember a classical Dirichlet character was a character, a homomorphism from Z mod and Z cross to C cross. So I can, across this isomorphism, I can inflate it up to get, give myself a character of IQ mod Q cross. So a classical Dirichlet character mod some integer may be viewed as a character of IQ mod Q cross, the group of ideal classes for Q. And it's a, since Z mod and Z cross is finite order by inflating, this character that you get of IQ mod Q cross is, is a homomorphism of finite order. So a Dirichlet character of a number field F, my working definition is it's a homomorphism of the group of ideal classes of F. So homomorphism from that to C cross, and I want this homomorphism to be a finite order, okay? So let me just remind you of some uh, basic algebraic number theory going in here. So if I take an integral ideal in this uh, number field F and I write it as a product of, uh, you know, uh, it's a, the ring of integers of dedicated domain. So it's uniquely a product of prime ideals, the product of P in S being the support of this ideal, P to the MP. And you can use this ideal M exactly as, like in this uh, exercise you know, for Q. At infinity, you take, uh, so what I've denoted F infinity cross with a plus to denote for the complex places, it's C cross and for the real places, it's positive reals. And for primes dividing M, I take uh, you know, one plus P to the MP OP, OP is the ring of integers of FP, the completion of F at P. And for primes P not dividing M, you take the full units. This is an open subgroup inside the group of ideals. And you take the corresponding subgroup inside uh, the group of ideal classes, which is this, you know, tack on F cross and then divide by F cross. These are the subgroups of finite index, open subgroups of finite index. These are sometimes also called congruent subgroups inside the group of ideal classes. Uh, so I'll get to this uh, construction in a moment, you know, it's over here. So I want to uh, introduce some other ingredients. Let me denote by J sub F of M, the group of all fractional ideals of F relatively prime to M. And P sub F of M is a group of all principal fractional ideals. So generated by an element X, X times OF, where X is some element of F cross. And I want this X to be congruent to one modulo M and X is, uh, 
this bigger than bigger than zero is to mean it's totally real under all the real embeddings you know, x is maps to some uh, some positive real number so if i take this quotient jfm mod pfm this is what's called the ray class group mod m so i'm going to denote that as cl sub f of m is the group of fractional ideals model principal ideals of this kind fact this ideal group of ideal classes if mod f cross modulo this open subgroup uh, that i constructed gives me a ray class group mod m this is in some sense a small generalization of this kind of uh, isomorphism with z mod and z cross so i could you know sort of depending upon what i want to do i could transfer my attention across an isomorphism like this and consider uh, a character of ray class group mod m yeah so the dirichlet character mod m is a character of such a ray class group although uh, later i'm really going to be thinking in terms of uh, such homomorphisms uh, you should think of this as the easiest examples of automorphic forms on gl1 for this number field f but i'm getting ahead of the story if i start talking about automorphic forms i want to start uh, i want to continue with this classical development and the goal restated is well just like dirichlet started with the character of z mod and z cross and wrote down a certain uh, dirichlet series ls chi likewise if i now start with a finite order character like this of i f mod f cross and translate it to a character of this ray class group i for every ideal a integral ideal a which is relatively prime to m i can take the image of a in this class group and apply chi to that so i i can write down a certain uh, dirichlet series and here it's chi a divided by the norm of a the absolute norm of a to the power s this is a well studied l function and i am interested in understanding the special values uh, of such a function this is slightly more general than the dirichlet l functions of the previous page i want to step it up a little further and i want to introduce uh, a general class of characters for a number field which will be uh, called hecker characters so what's a hecker character so f is going to be a number field by which i mean i didn't quite i already used it i didn't quite say what it is the finite extension of q uh, as a aesthetic point you know a number field is not sitting inside q bar or complex numbers it's just a finite extension of q qx modulo x squared plus 1 is a number field to say it's qi i've made a choice of i square root of minus 1 kind of thing so that's the sort of uh, philosophical distinction i'm trying to make it's just a finite extension of q i hope i remember to make this come back to this point at a later stage anyway so a number field for me is a finite extension of q i take if is a group of ideals of f and it's a restricted product of all the completions with respect to the units uh, f cross is a group of principal ideals and this sits diagonally in the group of ideals and this quotient if mod f cross which i've already used in the previous page is the group of ideal classes a hecker character of f by definition is a continuous homomorphism of the group of ideal classes to c cross so it's an element of the dual group if you will some kind of contract and dual of this group of ideal classes so hecker character is just a continuous homomorphism i do not want in general for this character to be unitary i don't want i'm not asking for the sky the image of kai to land inside s1 okay so uh, i want to allow myself twisting take twist i want to allow myself uh, take such a kai and twist it by absolute value idyllic absolute value norm to some integer i want to allow myself even such twist so i don't want these characters to be unitary just a continuous homomorphism to see cross so given such a hecker character chi of f for any place v i can look at fv cross sitting inside if and in fact it injects into if modulo f cross so a character any function there i can restrict to fv cross and that gives me the local character this which i'm going to denote chi sub v for a finite place v chi v is said to be unramified if it's trivial on the units and it's if you know the sort of ideal uh, the topology on ideals for almost all v uh, i'll be dividing out by ov cross so uh, so in any case for for almost all finite v my character local character at v is going to be unramified 
for an unramified place, actually take, take any place, uh, the local L function is, this is the definition, for a finite place, if V doesn't divide infinity, and if V is, if chi V is ramified, so if it's restriction to OV cross is non-trivial, then you just define this local L function to be one. If chi V is unramified for a finite place, then you define this, uh, it's a degree one Euler factor here, one minus chi V, this var pi V is the uniformizer uh, of F at V. It's a generator of the prime ideal P sub V times norm P, maybe there should, there should be a P sub V, norm P sub V to the minus S and this whole thing inverse. And for V dividing infinity, there's an explicit recipe. I will show you what this recipe is a little later. And one writes, one defines the global L function to be the product of all these local L functions. And one can ask, well, does this L function, does this have nice properties? So uh, back already with uh, Dirichlet L functions, when you define an infinite series or an infinite product like this, you have to worry about convergence. And uh, these are standard things to prove that uh, there is an analytic continuation positively with maybe uh, with a pole here or there, like the Riemann zeta function has a pole at s equals one finitely many poles, I beg your pardon. They could be poles. Yeah. A functional equation, a relation of this function at S and a relation of such a function at one minus S. I got a message that my internet connection is unstable. So if I have blanked out, you have to please somehow let me know. Uh, yeah, are you able to hear me? We missed just a few words, but we could make out what you were saying. Okay, okay, thanks. So this happens every now and then. I'm sitting in my office at ISER and the internet connection is mostly good, but occasionally it, uh, I have the same problem with, with my online teaching. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so I am in the process of defining uh, the Hecker L function attached to a Hecker character, which is an Euler product, such a product is called an Euler product of local L functions. Now what Hecker did was he wanted to understand he wanted to prove uh, nice analytic properties, or the kind, the basic kind that you prove with the Riemann zeta function, analytic continuation, functional equation, Euler product, uh, and so on. So these are the basic properties he wanted to first uh, have all straightened out. And for that, he realized that there's a large collection of characters of this kind for which you have especially nice analytic properties. And he called them Grosen character. So Christoph, you're going to correct my German pronunciation, Grosen character. Is that Swiss-ish? Those were pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Danke. So, uh, yeah. I, in this talk, I won't be quite defining Grosen character, but I'm going to be looking at a certain subclass of characters, uh, of uh, subclass of Grosen character, which are called algebraic Hecker characters. This is a certain class of characters which was introduced by Andre Way in a very beautiful paper in uh, 19, written in 1955. Uh, this appears in the proceedings of this conference. I think it's this famous conference in Japan uh, where uh, Way met. Uh, I think we lost your sound. Uh huh. So I was just talking about algebraic Hecke characters and I was just saying that uh, this is a class of characters that was introduced by Andre Way. And uh, it's a very uh, densely written uh, seven page article, which I have read many, many times. And each time some, some new detail catches my attention. In any case, uh, Andrew Bay himself says that this is a subclass of characters which, which have remarkable arithmetic properties. So I will define for you what's an algebraic Hecker character in a second. But my goal restated is I want to study the arithmetic properties of the special values of the L function attached to an algebraic Hecker character. Okay, so what is an algebraic Hecker character? These are what, uh, these uh, Andre Way called them characters of type A0. So, well, I start with a Hecker character. Let chi be a Hecker character of a number field F. And we say chi has modulus some integral ideal M if it is trivial on the kind of subgroup that I've already introduced you to. So at all the finite places for P dividing M, it's that congruent subgroup where P to the MP is the largest power of P dividing M. And for P not dividing M, it's OP cross. So if chi is trivial on that, we say chi has modulus M. Now, 
the idea of algebraicity of the psychic character is determined by what is happening at infinity. So, so what's happening at infinity? So inside the group of ideals, what is F infinity? So it's F tensor R. It's the product of all the Archimedean completions of F, which is a product of, forget the crosses for the moment. So F tensor R is a product of real, for the real places I get real numbers and for complex places I get the completion as C. And F infinity cross is the sort of units in this product of field. So it's a product of R stars cross the product of C crosses. So SR is going to be my notation for the set of real places. And let me say there are R1 many real places and S sub C is the set of complex places. I also will need to be uh, using all the complex embeddings of F. And of course, from there's a canonical surjection from the set of all complex embeddings of F to the set of Archimedean places. So for if it's a real place, then this tau V is just a embedding of F into R. But if it's a complex place, then I have two com complex embeddings related to each other by complex conjugation. The choice of tau V in this notation is not canonical. Either one of the pair tau V or tau V bar could be, I can interchange their roles. So we think of, so we, def we say chi is an algebraic Hecke character mod M of infinity type N, N bar where what is n bar? n bar is uh, there is one integer n, n tau for every complex embedding tau of f. So uh, you can think of this n n bar as you know like a an, like an element of the integral group algebra. If you will. there's no group here, this I'm, this I'm just looking at the set of complex embeddings, and for each complex embedding, I take an integer. Okay, and we say chi is algebraic if chi infinity the the Archimedean component of chi, which is the character of that, which is a tensor of product of characters of R crosses and C crosses. If this looks like on for the R cross, for the real places, it is XV to the N tau V. And for a complex place, it is XV to N tau V to the power N tau V and X bar V to the power N tau bar V. So what's happening here? You got to think of R cross and C cross as real Lie groups or real algebraic groups. And I'm looking at real, uh, so algebraic homomorphisms of this real algebraic group to C cross, where C cross on um, the image C cross is also a real algebraic group. So for, for R cross, the algebraic homomorphisms are simply, you know, X goes to X to the N. But for C cross, the algebraic homomorphisms, the real algebraic homomorphisms from C cross to C cross are of the form a complex number Z, non-zero complex number Z going to Z to the P, Z bar to the Q kind of thing. So all those integers are these exponents are, that constitute the infinity type. So we say a character, Hecke character is algebraic if the character at infinity is a, really a homomorphism of this, uh, this real point of the stores. Now this actually is a very serious restriction. Uh, there is a very serious restriction on the possible infinity types. I cannot have arbitrary integers, arbitrary exponents here. And this serious restriction is sometimes called purity. What is purity? So let's suppose I have an algebraic Hecke character of some modulus and infinity type n, n bar. Then if there is a single real place, if S sub r is not empty, if F has a, if F has a real place, then all these numbers, all these exponents that you see here, they're all equal. There exists an W, an integer W, such that n tau equals W for every complex embedding tau of f. Okay. And if there are no real places, i.e., if f is totally imaginary, then this purity condition is uh, kind of uh, intricate and beautiful. There is an integer W such that uh, n tau plus n tau bar. So the integer for tau and the integer of tau bar add up to W. Not only that, but for every Galois conjugate. So I take any ga gamma and Galois Q bar over Q, and I can compose tau with gamma. Okay, my tau is really a homomorphism from F to C, but F is a number field, so its image lies in Q bar. So I can further compose it with any uh, Galois automorphism of Q bar, uh, any automorphism of Q bar. So gamma compose tau and gamma compose tau bar makes sense. And it, the corresponding integers, they also have to add up to W. 
this condition is uh, uh, imposes a lot of restrictions for a later part of the story. And the proof of purity is uh, just boils down to you have to go through, uh, you know, because of continuity here of this, there's a continuous homomorphism and there will be, it's trivial on some part here. So there is an sort of it's aspect of this, this open subgroup inside what is happening at infinity because I want it to be trivial on principle it is. So if you have put those things together, then it, one realizes that on the principal ideals, uh, the copy of that inside the Archimedean part, it has to be trivial on a certain uh, subgroup of the units. These are units, global units, which are one mod M and totally positive. And because it's trivial on this, then it becomes a standard exercise in algebraic number theory to show that it forces these conditions on those exponents. Okay. So, let me just draw an easy corollary to uh, this uh, purity lemma on which is a condition on the infinity type that if I have a real place, remember all these exponents are equal. So I can just kind of take that apart, uh, pull that apart in terms of a Tate twist. So corollary, if, if F has a real place, then an algebraic Hecker character of F looks like I take this, the infinite part out just in terms of the idyllic norm to the W and then what remains is a relatively easy exercise to realize that that's a character of finite order. Or in other words, any algebraic Hecker character of a number field with a real place, it just looks like a Dirichlet character with a Tate twist by an integer. If F is totally imaginary, then it's, uh, it gets more interesting somehow in the story. Then it looks like uh, a unitary Hecker character times idyllic norm to the W by two, where W is that purity weight W. Okay, this is not entirely obvious, but then if you think about it, it's relatively clear. And the reason Andre Way studied these characters is, uh, so this I've essentially borrowed from Way's paper, is if you read Kaya as a homomorphism of on this group of ideals model, uh, relatively prime to M, then, it follows from the definition and the security uh, constraints that there exists a number field E, which takes all the values of chi. So chi on any ideal here lives in E, or in other words, the coefficients of the Dirichlet series, summation chi A by norm A to the S, A being an integral ideal relatively prime to M, all these coefficients here, they're all in E, some number field E. And then this puts us in the right arithmetic context. So let me just pause for a second, digress and come back. You see, if, you're, if I'm going to study modular forms and their L functions, if I have a modular form and I have a Fourier expansion summation a n q to the n, and I want to study its L function summation a n by n to the s, to put myself in the right arithmetic context, I want to look at a, uh, an eigen form, a new form, uh, such a form is called primitive, and I normalize so that the first Fourier coefficient is one. Then it's a fact going back to Shimura that all the, uh, the Fourier coefficients live in a number field. The field generated by over Q by the Fourier coefficients of a primitive modular form, normalized primitive form is live in a number field. And so this is some of the GL1 analog uh, of uh, that statement of modular forms. It puts us in the right arithmetic context. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. And if, uh, if there were any questions on an algebraic Hecke character, I, I can take questions now. And if not, let me just continue. So uh, maybe another digression, uh, just to tell you that uh, these algebraic Hecke characters show up in a, you know, in a certain geometric context. In some sense, I was interested uh, because of some past work in this kind of a geometric context and uh, this is where I'm coming from. So given an, such an integral ideal M, I can consider what we might call a locally symmetric space for the algebraic group GL1 over F with level structure M. Now these sound like fancy words. What I mean is just the sort of uh, quotient. Uh, if I take G to be the, this torus over Q, which is the restriction from F to Q of GL1 over F. And I look at GA mod GQ mod some group at infinity times some open compact subgroup depending on this level structure M which is just this group of 
EDL classes modulo the sort of thing I was dividing by something at infinity and this open subgroup uh, at the finite places. So if, if G was some reductive group over Q, then these, this is really a locally symmetric space as these words are used say by a differential geometer. Now there are various choices of the C infinity I could divide by that appear in various contexts, which I'm going to ignore that statement. Now, let me uh, show you a certain context where these algebraic Hecke characters arise. So I give myself such an infinity type, satisfying the necessary purity conditions. I take a extension of Q, a finite Galois extension, a number field E, which takes a copy of F. And this E is the same E as in this, uh, or something larger than this E, which takes all the values of chi. Oh, sorry. So, this field E is like the field of coefficients. And given this infinity type N, I can look at the corresponding algebraic representation of this algebraic group. And there's a standard construction which gives me a sheaf uh, corresponding to that algebraic representation of that algebraic group on this locally symmetric space. And once I have a sheaf on a topological space, I couldn't look at sheaf cohomology. And fact, an algebraic Hecke character mod M of infinity type N uh, contributes to the cohomology of this space with coefficients in the sheaf. This space is going to have cohomology in degree zero and by duality in top degree, one of them has to be the compact supports. So in any case, it, it gives me global sections of uh, this idyllic quotients with coefficients in a sheaf that you can cook up using this infinity type. So this kind of a context is uh, it's very, it shows up naturally if you, even if you are interested in modular forms and you want to study the cohomology of GL2, you know that these locally symmetric spaces are not compact. You can compactify them. There are all sorts of compactifications. In particular, one could consider the borel uh compactification. And the, the boundary, uh, the cohomology of the boundary is built out of cohomology of such tori, these kind of tori these tori here. And what contributes to the cohomology of the tori, which appears in the boundary cohomology are exactly this kind of algebraic Hecke characters. So, so some of, uh, I have done some work with Harder uh, on the cohomology of GLN. And it's to that story that I was getting interested in and went back from GLN to GL1. So this is my, this talk is my, is a presentation of what I now understand of GL1 in some sense. Okay, so now I've defined what's an algebraic Hecke character. I'm interested in the L functions and their special values. And the question to understand is, well, do they even exist? So this is the analog of the GL2 question. Do we, do we even have uh, holomorphic modular forms, uh, which are eigen forms, new forms, whatever? So the answer is yes, of course, the stock would be void. And this is uh, in Andrew Bay's paper. He says this is an exercise uh, Artin showed to him that this is basically an exercise in Galois theory. It's not an entirely trivial exercise as I have uh, I've been growingly appreciating the story. So let me just tell you uh, how it goes. So I take a number field, I take a F, I take an integral ideal M, take an infinity type uh, N bar, assume it's pure and the, the integer W which showed up in the purity lemma that, that I call it the purity weight. And all those exponents recall were all equal to each other. And in some sense, these are all the algebraic Hecke characters for if there were a real place. So the first statement is if F has a real place, any algebraic Hecke character looks like a finite order character, also called a Dirichlet character, twisted with a tate twist, integral tate twist. So that's kind of uh, easy. If F is totally imaginary, then it's a little more interesting. Here, you I'm going to let F, F naught stand for the maximal totally real subfield inside F. And it's easy to see that there's at most one totally imaginary quadratic extension F1 of this F0. This F1, if it is uh, to a totally imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field is also called a scheme field. So this F1 is a scheme subfield of F. Then an algebraic Hecke character of some you know, modulus and some infinity type is necessarily a base change from F1 of an algebraic, algebraic Hecke character of a totally real field, twisted by some finite order. And 
for a CM field, it's uh, one one has to prove that algebraic Hecke characters for CM fields exist, and that is uh, that is another another sub exercise. So I'm not proving this proposition to you. I'm just telling you that this is the shape of algebraic Hecke characters for a general number field. So. In some sense, if there's a real place, the story is easy. If it's a totally imaginary, then the story kind of comes down to something for a CM field via a base change with a possible finite, uh, up to finite error, or finite twist. In any case, they exist. And it's most interesting for a totally imaginary field containing a CM field. Let me fix, uh, skip that dot. And just to give you, uh, to have some example in mind as we go along is uh, you can keep this, you take the cube root of two, you adjoin that and you take its Galois closure, which is Q adjoined cube root of two comma omega, omega is a cube root of unity. If this is my F, then the maximal totally real subfield F naught is in fact Q. And this F1, this totally imaginary quadratic is Q omega. So an algebraic Hecke character of F here is a base change from something from Q omega, twisted by any finite order character. So now I want to get into the special values of the L function, the critical set for uh, these L functions. So this is again the same notations. Uh, let me just quickly show you the L factors at infinity at a real place, you take gamma sub r as pi to the minus s by two gamma s by two. And at a complex place, gamma sub c of s is really gamma sub r of s times gamma sub r of s plus one. And let me just gloss over the details here. I, let me just say, if I give you an algebraic Hecke character in terms of the exponents, you can write down precisely the L factors at infinity and you package them all together, take their product and that is the Archimedean L factor L sub infinity of S chi. Definition, this definition is uh, usually attributed to Deline. An integer M is said to be critical for L S chi if both the gamma factors L, the Archimedean factors at S for chi and at one minus S for chi inverse. So these are the gamma factors on either side of the functional equation. Both these guys have to be finite at, at this integer M. If you work out this exercise for uh, the Riemann zeta function, there the gamma factor is only this guy, pi to the minus s by two gamma s by two. If this function at m and at one minus m are both finite, then you see that the critical set is in fact a set of even positive integers and odd negative integers. That's where you have uh, good looking special value statements for the Riemann zeta function. No one knows what is zeta three. Well, you know it's irrational, but after that you don't know much. But zeta two, zeta two m, you know exactly. You have a very you have a close formula there. You know either. So we we want to make some analogous statements about the critical values of an L function of an algebraic Hecke character. So that's where we are headed. So what is the critical set? Let me just uh, show you the critical set. A set of all integers which are critical for this uh, Hecke L function. If F is totally real, and suppose there are two places, okay, I have to tell you what's the character at real place. So chi sub V for a real place, this is a homomorphism from R cross to C cross. It looks like, you know, in any case, there's a sign part and then there's an absolute value. Remember, after taking off the absolute value to the W, it was some finite order character and that finite order character will have a signature at that real place. So the signatures, if the signatures are distinct at two distinct places, then there is no critical value, critical point. And if all the signatures are same, if all the signatures are trivial, then the critical set looks like the critical set of the Riemann zeta function. And if all the signatures are non-trivial, this is like an odd Dirichlet character, like the non-trivial quadratic Dirichlet character mod four then the critical set is going to be one, three, five, et cetera. And it's sort of mirror image on the, not mirror image, it's image under the functional equation on the other side, zero minus two minus four and so on. There is a, the behavior for a, for totally real is quite different from what happens for a totally imaginary place. So here, remember that purity had this n tau and n tau bars and n tau plus n tau bar was a purity weight W. 
But if I take the difference of those exponents, n tau and n tau bar, take the absolute value and the minimum, this integer starts playing an important role. This L, the minimum of n tau minus n tau bar, I'm going to call the width of n, the infinity type. Or if chi had infinity type n, n bar, I will also call this the width of chi. For GLN, there's an analog story where we'll, we call it the cuspidal width. It's somehow how far apart are these exponents, these parameters, the, the numbers which show up in the Langmans parameters. Anyway, so in this case, the critical set for a totally imaginary field, the critical set is a finite set of integers between one minus W by two plus L by two and minus W by two plus L by two. And if you stare at this set a little, this is a finite set centered at one minus W by two. And it's a contiguous set, meaning if n, m, n plus one, n plus two and so on, of L elements where L is the width. So this L is also the width of the critical set. It's a finite set. This is reflecting more what's happening with GL2 and modular forms. If you, and some of you might know, if I take a modular form of weight K, holomorphic modular form primitive, uh, and I look at the, its critical set, the critical set is one, two, three, up to K minus one. It's a finite set with K minus one elements. So this is closer to that. In is there a sign error there? Say this again. Is there a sign error there or is that right? Where? where? In the yeah. width of- You mean a minus sign? sign. You need a minus sign in front of the that L that you're close to now. They will have to have a minus sign. Yes, sorry about this. The, here, this this plus where my cursor is should be a minus. Yeah, thank you. Otherwise, you know, I I have written a set which is empty. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for catching that. Uh, and uh, if there is, if F is a field with uh, both a real place and a complex place, then the critical set is empty. Okay. So this is an easy calculation. There's nothing deep here going on. It is just a calculation using these, the, using the definition of uh, both the gamma factors on either side of the functional equation. We want it to be finite at the center. What can we say about the critical values? So here is, in some sense, the main theorem of the day. This theorem is due to harder. And the way I'm stating it uh, has inputs from a certain calculation of Deline involving uh, periods of motives, which you don't see at all here. And I have put in my name there uh, just to say that writing it in a certain way that I'm going to present it to you is maybe yeah, this is I, I have that that's all my contribution is in, in fixing a certain sign, a certain signature, and that somehow is the point of this talk. So let F be a, and after I state the theorem, I'll tell you a little more about the history of uh, and how this comes about. So I take a totally imaginary field for this theorem. So my critical set is a contiguous set. Uh, I take, let chi be an algebraic Hecke character mod M with a certain pure infinity type. And let's say this has coefficients in a number field E, okay? And I told you this E is just a finite extension. I want to work with, uh, you know, uh, working with complex uh, functions, complex valued L functions. So I, I mapped myself into C using an embedding iota of E to Q bar or E to C. Then iota chi, one has to go through uh, a little bit of uh, bookkeeping here and realize that iota chi is a complex valued algebraic Hecke character of this modulus M and infinity type N. That is the sort of object that I have been, in some sense, talking about all along. Assume that this width is at least two. I want at least two critical points for a certain story to, uh, for, the, for this story. This is the analog of, uh, for modular forms, I want a modular form of weight at least three. Okay. For a weight two modular form, I have only one critical point, the center of symmetry. If, if the weight is at least three, then I have at least two critical points. And remember these fields, the F naught is this maximal totally real field and F1 over F naught is, uh, this is the CM extension of F naught. This F1 is unique over F naught. I take a D in F naught, which is totally negative, so that F1 is obtained by adjoining the square root of D. And using this capital D, I define some quantity delta sub F1, which is the norm from F naught to Q of this D, and then I take the square root 
and take delta sub f is delta sub f1 to the power this, the degree of that extension f over f1. This number appears in the theorem below. I take an integer m and let's suppose m and m plus one are both critical. Then the first assertion is that i, i is a choice of square root of minus one, i to the degree of f over two times this delta f times this a successive ratio of critical values lives in iota e. So it lives in this field of coefficients, but move to complex numbers. And furthermore, there is a beautiful reciprocity of this kind. For every element gamma in the Galois group of q bar over q, if I hit this quantity by gamma, gamma applied to this quantity looks like the same quantity for the gamma conjugate. So gamma compose iota applied to chi and gamma compose iota applied to chi. So the appearance of gamma on this quantity is the same quantity for the gamma iota conjugate of chi. So what sort of statement is this? Let me, uh, you see, if my E is large enough, the, this I and delta F could in fact be even absorbed here. So this ratio, first of all, the first thing to realize is the statement tells me that this ratio of critical L values for an algebraic Hecke character of a totally imaginary field is algebraic. Forget, forget the delta and the I power of I. This ratio is algebraic and it is Galois Q bar over Q equivariant up to a sign. If I change this, see gamma I divided by this I, that is just a sign. Gamma of delta F divided by this delta F, this is also, you know, because of the square root, this is also a sign. So gamma applied to this ratio of L values is up to a sign, the ratio of L values for the gamma conjugate. Uh, I just noticed my delta sub f has become a d sub f here. Uh, this d is delta. All, all I was trying to tell you is uh, there is a signature involved and this signature was somehow uh, missing in the literature before. So what is the history of theorems of this kind? So first of all, there is this kind of very applied to a rank one motive, uh, it would give me a statement about the critical values of L. Okay, once again, I got a internet connection is unstable message. So if yeah, I have blanked out. You just missed a few words just before you said rank one motive. I see, okay, so, uh, so there is a famous conjecture of Delin in Core Wallace and uh, if when applied to rank one motives tells us, gives us a certain uh, recipe for uh, critical values of motivic L functions from which one can deduce statements of this kind. That deduction is not trivial and that is in fact, uh, this contribution here I'm mentioning that the he periods from which one can deduce that such a theorem should be there. Now, Harder wrote this uh, very uh, sort of pioneering paper in Invention is in 1987, where he set forth the theory of Eisenstein cohomology for GL2. And from that, it follows a certain theorem about ratios of critical values. But the theorem that he had is that this ratio is algebraic, that is okay. But this signature was missing. So it seemed as if uh, this ratio of L values is in fact, uh, Galois equivariant. And so Delin's calculation said that, okay, there is, there is some signature here. And uh, it took me you know, many months, uh, maybe almost a year to figure this out, that signature lurks actually deep inside in Harder's paper itself, and one had to somehow pull it out. So my contribution is just to say that one, one has a theorem of this kind. And I have a generalization of such a theorem to L functions of GLN over a CM field. And furthermore, uh, further generalization to L functions uh, for rank and Selberg L functions for a totally imaginary field. I will very quickly show you, so I am 50 minutes past, uh, and maybe in two minutes, I'll just show you the theorem for GLN over CM field. And uh, the one, the story for totally imaginary field, I have some 
preprint written on and it's there on my homepage. But uh, I warn you that that preprint suffers from the same problem as Harder's invention is paper that there is a signature which is missing. In some sense, I've been working on this sign problem for a while now. But for GLN or a CM field, it seems to be uh, I seem to have it. I have to say this. There's a long history about the special values uh, results of this kind for uh, L functions of GLN and especially for a totally imaginary field in various contexts. The names to mention are Hida, Mugla, Glacius, Harris, Grobner, Lin, this is G. Lin, Harris's student, Sachdeva, this Gunja Sachdeva was my student. Anyway, so. Let me, uh, I'm somewhat running out of time, so I want to skip some notations that I'm picking up to state the theorem, but I want to show you the essence of the theorem. So let me uh, just cut to the chase and just show you a certain theorem for GLN. So now uh, I was all the while talking about GL1 and algebraic Hecke characters. These are the GL1 analogs, the arithmetic theory of automorphic form somehow starts with Andrew paper, uh, is one of the starting points, if you will. And I can talk about analogous objects for GLN. The words to mention are, this is a cuspidal automorphic representation of com logical type. There is, a, uh, there is an infinity type, which has a bunch of numbers, these exponents. There is a, analogously, there is a purity lemma here. This is due to Fazel. And the critical set for the standard L function for this uh, object on GLN is now a, a set of uh, integers or half integers of a certain shape. The W there is minus W here. And here I think I got the sign of the L, right? Uh, in any case, uh, never mind about the details. It's a finite set centered over some point involving the purity weight. And the width of this uh, critical strip is this a certain number L, which we call the width. In this case, we call it the cuspidal width of that infinity type. And here, uh, the assertion is, if I'm assured of at least two critical points, then the ratio of successive critical values is algebraic. But if I want to have this delicate reciprocity law, the right ingredients are a certain power of i, i to the n, n for GLN, times the degree of f over 2 or degree of f plus. Uh, I'm working with a CM field, so there's a maximal totally real subfield f plus. This f over f plus, maybe just one line. F is a CM field, so it's totally imaginary quadratic over a totally real field. And omega is the quadratic character of F plus attached to this quadratic extension. And the Gauss sum of that quadratic character shows up to the right power. And then I have the, the nice looking reciprocity law that this quantity, this algebraic quantity, if I hit it by Galois element, then it's the same quantity for the, that Galois conjugate, conjugated object. And the relation between this and the previous one, I take put n equals one. And if I take, uh, and you realize that this Gauss sum, one has to prove a little lemma, very pretty if you uh, played around with uh, Gauss sums and quadratic Gauss sums, uh, then uh, it, these are very, it's very attractive, uh, pleasant calculations. This Gauss sum is in fact that quantity delta in the previous page. And let me just say that the proof uses there's a statement about GLN or a CM field. I use automorphic induction to transfer myself from GLN over F to GL2N over F plus. And for GL, arbitrary GL over a totally real field, harder and I studied Eisenstein cohomology and proved some statement for special values. So I had to bring in automorphic induction in my work with harder and from which this theorem follows with the right reciprocity law, with the right signature appearing in this reciprocity law. And this specializes for n equals one to this theorem, which I will leave here. And uh, with this, I end my talk. And I'll be very happy to answer uh, any questions you might have. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Ragram. Okay, there is a, there is an emoticon way of doing this to hold on like this. Yes. Okay. So, uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, just one simple question. Um, um, in that ratio of critical L values, um, the denominator could be zero sometimes. Yeah, so uh, indeed, I have glossed over this point. For the GL1 situation uh, here, it, it, this won't be happening. But in this GLN situation, uh, it is true that uh, this denominator could be zero. So, so if you look at my uh, preprint about L functions for GLN, so I say this. 
one has to say that if the denominator is zero for uh, if a, if it is zero, it happens for the central critical value, and in if it is zero for iota pi, it is also zero for all the Galois conjugates of iota pi. Uh -huh. So you see, this is somewhat like uh, in Delin's article in Corvallis, uh, he attributes a certain conjecture to Gross. Gross's conjecture is the order of vanishing of a motivical function at a critical point is independent of which embedding iota I take. This oh, iota, yeah. recall, where, where is this iota? Iota is an embedding from the coefficient field to C. The order of vanishing is, is independent of iota. Right. I'm unable to say anything about order of vanishing, but I can say that if it vanishes for one iota, it vanishes for every iota. And so having observed that, now let me work in a situation where the, the denominator critical value is in fact non-zero. Okay. And then one has the statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Raghuram, yeah. how does your result compare to your book with harder? I mean, is it- uh -huh. So uh, I, I, I recognize your name by your voice. <laughs> uh, see, uh, well, thanks for showing up, Fredun. Uh, how does the result compare with the book with harder? Uh, the my book with harder the base field is a totally real field mm -hmm. and we didn't say anything when there was a complex place because the archimedean calculations that one had to do is just happens to be a completely different beast uh, so this preprint i mentioned here this generalized to L functions for GLN plus GLN prime over a totally imaginary field. So, like, Sorry? Yeah, like a chain injection. It doesn't say anything about the height of the correspondences. So, because of that, you can't produce an a priori bound um, uh, just using those conjectures. I... By day, survive. So, what are we and doing? Anymore, have this... what? For Any... example, you need to be able to say that. Um, I... Uh, some, there seems to be some cross conversation going on. Uh -huh, there's a cross conversation going yeah, on. Yeah, okay, so sorry about that. It's the first time, <laughs> first time experiencing it. <laughs> anyway, sorry, you're in the middle of uh, you're in the middle of commenting on. Uh, yeah, so I will. I, I just went to the list of participants to see, and I see a lot of familiar names. Well, uh, hello everyone, and I wish I had I could meet you all in person. Anyway, so back to uh, Shahidi's question: How does this relate to my work with Harder? Uh, my work with Harder the base field is a totally real field. And a big challenge was to, I don't know, this might get a little technical. So to play the game, uh, you know, in this langland Shahidi program, you have to, uh, for this L, rankin selberg L function, I want to take this, a certain, I start with an induced representation, uh, inducing from this, the, the representations I take and on these GLs, which will be a representation of the levy of an ambient GL. And that induced representation, one has to arrange that this induced representation appears in the Borel cell, in the cohomology of the Borel cell boundary of this ambient GL. And this involves a certain uh, delicate uh, uh, statements with constant representative, certain elements in the while group of this ambient GL. So in my preprint or a totally imaginary field, in fact, a large part of it was just pinning down that combinatorial lemma. Anyway, so in any case, Harder and I didn't work through a field with an imaginary place. And so the, that's this, this preprint here is all about the work with Harder, now doing by myself the totally imaginary. Mm -hmm. And for a CM field, one can, I'm just kind of uh, a little lucky. So for a CM field, since you're there, Shahidi, I should tell you that uh, we are, what we are doing is, so I induce and land myself into GL2N over a totally real place. I can use the theorems with harder and I have some statement for that, uh, uh, for the L function for GL2N, but that involves certain periods for the automorphically induced representation. And I relate the periods that harder and I studied to the periods that you and I studied, namely the periods coming from Whitaker models and cohomology and how they behave under twisting. So I use my, you know, you know what I did with you. Uh, so when I say you, well, the other people in the audience, I'm talking to Fredun Shahidi here. So uh, Shahidi and I studied certain periods of automorphic forms for GLN upon twisting these automorphic forms by characters. 
and I had to relate the periods that Harder and I had to use to the periods uh, which, which are also called Betty Whitaker periods. Uh, and bringing these ingredients together gives a proof for this CM field situation. But this kind of CM field uh, trickery cannot be done for a general, totally imaginary field. Where is my, that example of, it? yeah, this example. You see here, uh, it already this kind of thinking breaks down. If, if I had a representation of GLN over this field, well, I guess this is some cubic non-Galva. Well, this is Galva, so uh, yeah, I know I, I could do automorphic induction here, but then there is some cubic twisting happening, and uh, here I don't know how it's going to go. I haven't worked it out actually. Uh, anyway, so that's that's my answer to your question. By the way, where are you now? I am in India. I'm in Pune. I'm stuck in Pune. You're not stuck there. You're you're at home. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm at home. That's right. That's right. So uh, uh, we are we are all stuck in our local our, at our local places, <laughs> okay. and we, we wish we all globalized. <laughs> yeah. The vaccine okay. is coming, so there is a hope. Yeah. 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 Well, at least at least we have this Zoom business to be able to talk to each yeah. other. By the way. Any I know. Other yeah, comments? So this, this has its virtues, this uh, kind of Zoom meeting. Yeah. Any other comments or questions for Raghuram? I think it's really beautiful work, very really technical work, but um, um, I think we can have a good, interesting conversation on the technical side, maybe, but reserve that for later. If there are Let no me other stop comments? my sharing so that I can see the grid of all four who are all there. Uh, now <laughs> I see. Okay, very good. Okay. Yeah. So, so this, this uh, is my office, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Ralph Greenberg is here. Good. Okay, so... I, I have a uh, quick question. Sorry, who's that? It's Steve Cutler. I just had a oh, quick hi, question. Steve. I was wondering... How are you? Yes. Hi, good how are you doing? You. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well. It's a yeah. little distance, but uh, it's better than yeah. the jet lag, right? <laughs> to talk this way. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you thought any these same kind of techniques as any way of attacking this sort of valence and critical values. In other words, you're talking about Deleen critical values, which are determined by this standard uh, gamma factors, poles, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, have, I mean, they're very delicate machine. And of course, valence then has a generalization for all integral values. And of course, the parameters and so on are completely, are rather different. But do these automorphic techniques have any hope to get it access uh, questions of where valence and critical? I mean, let's say for HECA L, for HECA L series, where in some cases, there are no algebraic Hecke characters as you're writing down and maybe, or there are cases where there are ones where the critical strip is just one point or so on. So there are lots of other integers where valence and conjecture will play and be in play. And can you see yeah. any way of getting at those at this kind of machine rate? Uh, I can make two comments. Uh, so first, uh, most of the water work I've been doing, which comes out of, you know, from Harder's uh, this uh, idea of Eisenstein cohomology, I kind of alluded to a certain combinatorial lemma when I was answering uh, Shahidi's question that when we have to put a certain induced representation in this borel set boundary, there is some delicate uh, combinatorics which is coming in. And that right. the beauty of that combinatorics is that uh, it works exactly for critical values, for every pair of critical values, no more and no less. So mm -hmm. a certain important step of the Eisenstein cohomology program breaks down when one of the L values is not critical, okay? Right, I mean, you're so, looking at this constant formula for a cohomology in the, in the unipotent radical, I suppose, right? I mean, there's this constant right. formula so, that tells you that the, you, you get end up with things involving the, the cohomology of a local system coming from the unipotent radical, and there's this co these formulas for that where you know for what values of where that cohomology is is supported and so on, right? These constant right. formulas. So, That's what uh, yeah. so the the delicacy is part of the you know in this Langlands uh, you take the standard intertwining operator between an induced representation and induced representation on the other side, and this is somehow a reflection of the constant term of an Eisenstein series. And right. So when you start bringing this, so there's a parabolic and then it's associate parabolic. You have to arrange for an induced representation to appear in the cohomology corresponding to a parabolic. And you have to mm -hmm. arrange for the sort of the partner induced representation to appear in the cohomology of the associate parabolic. 
and one has right. to do both of this simultaneously which forces this uh, this kind of delicacy into this uh, thinking and because mm -hmm. of which somehow this game works uh, for critical values and critical values only so for mm -hmm. first comment mm -hmm. so in particular uh, the work with harder and so also whatever else i have done since then do not give information or does not give information for non critical values mm -hmm. completely different uh, the one place where i have uh, dealt with a non critical value and so one might say uh, some kind of bayesian bayesian type l value uh, is playing a role is my paper with uh, baskar balasubramaniam on uh, congruences for uh, gln so what we proved for gln is uh, was a generalization of uh, something that hida hida had proved for modular forms that uh, if you take the the adjoint l function so take a let me just state it for modular forms and we can just make the jump to gln later on so take a modular form of weight k take the degree 3 adjoint l function for the action of gl2 on the lie algebra sl2 uh, and then you look at the value at uh, for what in the automorphic normalization at s equals 1 uh, mm -hmm. so for modular forms this might still be okay but if one is not in the hilbert modular situation then this l value is not a critical value and in my paper with baskar the adjoint the degree n squared minus 1 adjoint l function at s equals 1 uh, was a non critical value for which we were able to identify periods after dividing by which it is an algebraic number and if a prime appeared in that algebraic number it was a congruence prime so that is the essence of a certain other story so some automorphic method seems to see some kind of non critical values but uh, i don't know of any context in which one can make a systematic statement coming from the automorphic world capturing all the bayesian and type uh, uh, capturing a bayesian right. type statement so i i don't know but in particular the yeah but in particular your your non critical example is is more based on dyadic or congruence type methods as opposed to cohomological ones yes right? indeed i mean that that's basically what you you're telling us as i'm wondering another question would be this i mean so your the cohomology you're looking at is the cohomology of this ambient gln so the you have the gln cross gln prime and then you have some ambient gln which is gln plus n prime of course right and you have the parabolic associated to that that levy but i'm wondering if you embed into some larger groups or other groups whether you could get some more twisted versions of the l values in the cohomology in other words uh, this is a the sort of standard gln cohomology for borel serre but i'm wondering if maybe you looked at it for embeddings of this group into some other more twisted kind of classical groups for example uh whether there might be some other things lurking there uh, that's just a comment i mean i don't expect you to know the answer but i'm just a place yeah, where so, one could possibly uh, look in some sense uh, so uh so when the last time we met which was i i seem to recall it was at max planck <laughs> maybe after Probably, in yeah. harder's birthday party yeah. or yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe harder's so, harder's birthday so. conference so uh, uh in some sense what you're telling me is also part of that so the larger program to pursue is to go through the langlin shahidi list of l functions and in some sense ask oneself to what extent does eisenstein cohomology machinery give us you know uh, mm -hmm. interesting statements for critical values of automorphic l functions at this moment i can with uh, uh, with you know for orthogonal groups i have done something with my colleague here chandrashil bhagwat uh, so we can say if if i have an even orthogonal group then you you uh, put it in one larger uh, orthogonal group as you know the you know the the levy is dot 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 and it goes there you just delete this first simple root uh, then one can um, one gets a good looking statement on critical values for degree 2 nl functions for orthogonal groups even orthogonal group this is worked out there is another situation which is kind of getting worked out which is to do with asi l functions which comes out of uh, gln or a quadratic extension sitting as a levy inside a unitary group uh, sort of situation but in any generality i cannot say anything with uh, any confidence uh, when in the langlin shahidi thing if if the action of the levy on the by adjoint on the unipotent radical of that parabolic if that representation has more than one representation so in when you take this constant term or non constant term if you see more than one l function then 
I don't know of a single situation where the story has been worked out. Harder okay. says that he can see something for SP6 or something, which I, so it is, it is unclear at this moment. And you have just alluded to what would be a big step in this program of understanding arithmetic of Langland-Shahidian functions. Yeah. 